19. Naturally, the story was huge in the island examiner. The headline blared, Casino Boat Busted and Pollution Probe. Miles Umlaut wrote the article, which explained that the flushed waste was traced easily to the Coral Queen because the crud contained a highly visible inky colored substance. The front page of the newspaper featured an aerial photograph of our incriminating fuchsia stain. Not to brag, but it was impressive. As my father had predicted, the Coast Guard shut down the gambling boat right away. Dusty Muleman was not available for comment. Mike um, Miles Umlot and a couple of other reporters called our house and left messages. They all wanted to interview Dad now that his accusations against Dusty had been proven true. The old Payne Underwood would have eagerly picked up the phone and ranted, but the new Payne Underwood took Donna Underwood's advice and let it ring off the hook. My father didn't need to say anything to the newspaper because everyone in town knew the truth by now. They knew he was right about Dusty after all. The following morning, Grandpa Bobby borrowed Dad's pickup and drove to Miami Beach to surprise Uncle Dell and Aunt Sandy. He said they were really happy to see him alive, but after a while, they started acting kind of nervous and weird. They were probably freaking out, trying to think of a way to explain how they'd spent all that money my grandfather had left in the bank box. A day later, he returned to the Keys and stayed with us for a week, one of the neatest times of my life. Even Abby got jazzed. Every night, we'd stay up late listening to his Caribbean adventures. In the daytime, we went snorkeling or crabbing or wakeboarding behind the skiff. One afternoon, we took a metal detector to the sandbar where all the drunk tourists from Miami hang out, and we found $13 in change, four rings, two bracelets, a brand new Swiss Army knife, and somebody's gold molar. Suddenly, over breakfast one morning, Grandpa Bobby announced he was leaving. Where? I asked. Dad answered for him, back to South America. Grandpa Bobby nodded. You're not going to come hunting for me, are you, Payne? I want to promise. You've got it, my father said, not happily. Grandpa Bobby hitched a silvery eyebrow at my mother. Donna, I'm counting on you to keep this hot-headed husband of yours from running off the trails. Mom told Grandpa Bobby not to worry. We'll miss you, Pop, she said. But why are you leaving? Abby blurted. Why won't you stay here with us? It's tempting, Tiger. It truly is, my grandfather said. But don't forget. The U.S. government thinks I'm dead, and when the time is right, I'll be proud to march into the American embassy and stamp my fingerprint on a piece of paper and clear up all the confusion. But for now, it's useful that certain folks don't know I'm alive. I've got some important business to clear up before I can come home for good. My sister bolted from the table, but she didn't get far. Grandpa Bobby snagged her as she dashed by and pulled her into his arms. He used his faded bandana to dry her cheeks. What if something bad happens? Abby cried. I don't want you to die for real. But I can't live for real until I finish this thing, he said. Please try to understand. He fished something out of his pocket. These are for you, Abby. It's only fair since your brother got the queen's coin. Abby's eyes nearly popped out of her head. Whoa, she said under her breath. We all leaned in for a close look at the two green earrings. The stones were small, but the color was brilliant, like reef water. Emeralds, Grandpa Bobby said. Mom was dazzled, too. I won't ask where you got them, she said. Oh, probably another poker game, Dad remarked. Don't worry. I've earned them fair and square, said Grandpa Bobby. I've been carrying them around for years, hoping to meet just the right girl. And now I have. He dropped the emerald studs into Abby's palm and said, Those little greenies are worth more than diamonds. They're worth even more than that, said Abby to me. I'd never seen my sister so excited. After Mom helped her put on the earrings, she ran to check herself out in the hall mirror. Grandpa Bobby said, Abby, you're as lovely as your grandmother was. I only wish you could have known her. He looked at my father and son, I wish he didn't finish the sentence. Slowly he got up and went out the back door. Through the window, we could see him sag against the trunk of our big mahogany tree. He was rubbing his eyes. Do you still remember her? I asked my father. Like it was yesterday, Noah. Then he went outside and put an arm around the old pirate's shoulder. shoulders. Sometimes my parents make me slightly crazed, but the thought of losing either one of them is so unreal that I can't imagine it. I can't even try to imagine it. 
all these years, I never considered the possibility that my father, my well-meaning but occasionally whacked out father, might be walking around with a broken heart, carrying a pain too awful to talk about. I mean, his mom died when he was a kid, died. How could anyone be the same afterward? How could there not be a huge sad hole in your life? And how could it not get worse when somebody calls up to say that your father's gone too? The father you idolized, dead and buried in some faraway jungle. So maybe dad filled up all that, that emptiness in another way. Whenever he saw something bad or wrong, he'd just do about anything to make it right, no matter how reckless or foolish. It's possible he couldn't help himself. I think mom understood. I think that's why she's been so patient through the tough times. And maybe dad will be better now that he, he knows Grandpa Bobby is really alive. It's something to hope for anyway. On the afternoon before he left, my grandfather knocked on my bedroom door and said he wanted to go fishing. We grabbed a couple of spinning rods and headed off to Thunder Beach. The water was crystal clear and we waded up to our knees. Scads of minnows flashed like chrome spangles in the shallows and right away we spooked a sna snaggletooth barracuda that had been hanging motionless near a coral head. Grandpa Bobby started casting a small yellow bucktail, hoping it hopping it through the grassy patches where the snappers hang out. How are you going back? I asked. Same way I got here. There's a freighter leaving Key West for Aruba tomorrow, he said. From there, I'll hitch a ride on a banana boat. You sure about this? Grandpa Bobby said, oh, I'll be fine. Your mom even packed me a suitcase. Not the plaid one, I asked. Yeah, what's so funny? That's the one she takes out whenever she's thinking about dumping dad. Well, I guess that's not in the game plan anymore. My grandfather tucked the butt of the fishing rod under one arm and took another took out another old photograph to show me. There she is, he said proudly. It was a picture of the Amanda Rose. She was a classic too. That was taken in Cat K, he said, summer before you were born. Wow. She's forty six feet, twin diesels, eight hundred horses. The gleaming sport fisherman was tied stern first to a wooden dock where a monster blue marlin hung glassy-eyed from a tall, tall pole. In the picture, Grandpa Bobby's curly hair was so long it looked like a blonde afro. He was poised on a teakwood transom, raising a beer and a toast to the great fish. The dirt bags who hijacked my Amanda Rose, they've repainted the hole and changed her name, but that won't fly, he said confidently because I'll recognize her, no matter what. But what if you can't find her? I asked. Oh, I most definitely will know her. You can bet the damn ranch on that. He didn't take his eyes off that photograph. I built her myself, started shortly after your grandmother passed on. It was this boat that carried me through those terrible times, that and raising your daddy and his brother and sister. He folded up the snapshot and went back to fishing. All this might be tough for you to understand, he said quietly. Not at all. Ten years is ridiculous, Noah. Ten years without so much as a postcard. I'm lucky your father forgave me. I wish I could have seen his face that night you showed up, I said. Grandpa Bobby laughed. <laughs> know what he did? He jumped from the truck and snatched me up and swung me around in circles like a doll, same as I did to him when he was a little shrimp. He's got some serious muscle on his bones, your old man does. Hey, what's this? Finally, somebody got hungry. He jerked up on the rod and reeled in a small blue runner, which he tossed back. He caught another one on the very next cast. Hey, aren't you going to fish? He asked me. Sure. I threw my bucktail into the deeper water and started bouncing it along the bottom. How come you're so quiet? He said. The truth was, I felt as bummed out as Abby. I didn't want Grandpa Bobby to go away again. At the same time, I didn't want to make him feel guilty by saying so. He said, you don't believe I'll ever be back, do you? I'm worried, that's all. It was impossible not to worry. The knife scar on his cheek was a pretty strong clue that the men my grandfather was chasing were not model citizens. Whatever else they say about me, champ, I do keep my promises. Yeah, but, hey, are you snagged on a rock? No, I don't think so. It was a fish. As soon as I get the set the hook, it smoked 30 yards of line off the spool. Grandpa Bobby whistled. Probably just a big jack, I said. Want to bet? The fish fought hard, dogging back and forth across the flats. It made several more zippy runs, one between my ankles, before I was able to steer it to the beach. My grandfather was right. It wasn't a jack. It was a fat pink snapper.
Triumphantly, he pointed at the black telltale spot on its side. That's a mutton fish, Noah. Sweet, I said. It was the best snapper I'd ever caught. How big do you think it is? He smiled. How big do you want it to be? Just the truth, I told him. The truth? Six pounds, he said. But that's still one hell of a catch on a bucktail jig from a shoreline. I held the fish still while Grandpa Bobby unhooked it. You have to be super careful because snappers can bite through a human finger. No problem. No, are you hungry? I'm not. Me neither. Good, said Grandpa Bobby. He nudged the fish back into the water. It kicked its tail and tore off. Must be some kind of mystic underwood karma, he said. This looks like the very same spot where I caught that nice mutton with your daddy. Gotta be 25, 30 years ago. How big was yours again? I knew it was either 14 or 15 pounds, depending on who was telling the story. I was curious to hear which virgin grandpa Bobby was in the mood for. He said, your daddy recalls it as 14 on the button and his memory is likely better than mine. Still a beast. Yeah, but you got your whole life to catch one bigger. You'll do it too. There's no doubt in my mind. Because of the karma? Something like that, he said. You done fishing? I think so. Me too. We put down our rods and sat on the sand. With the change of a tide, change of tide, a breeze had picked up, kicked up, blowing in from the direction of the lighthouse. We could see two tankers and a cruise ship, all northbound in the Gulf Stream. Another loggerhead turtle surfaced on the chop in the chop off the beach. It was twice as big and crusty as the one I'd seen with Abby and Shelley. This time, though, I didn't need to jump in and scare it away. Today, the water looked perfect, the way it was a million years ago before people started using the ocean as a lantern. Today, it was awesomely pure and bright and totally safe for an old loggerhead to browse the grassy flat. Chow down, chill out, take a snooze. Don't be surprised, Grandpa Bobby said, if one sunny day you're swimming here at the beach or maybe just taking a stroll with some girl when a certain magnificent 46-footer comes hauling ass over that pearly blue horizon, yours truly up in the tuna tower. The thing was, I could picture the moment perfectly in my mind. All I had to do was close my eyes, and there was Robert Lee Underwood, streaking across the waves and the Amanda Rose. Nah, no, I'm not telling you to sit around and wait for me. That would be downright pathetic. He laughed and chucked my arm. All I'm saying is, don't be surprised when the day comes. I won't, I said, not even a little bit.